First, when it comes to Bitcoin, if we thought there was product narrative fit before, oh my God, could there be anything more profound than having your programmatic, predictable plan supply reduction happen at the same time that money printer go burr and that meme takes over the world in the context of the COVID response? On the other hand, we have this financial sandbox doing stupid crazy things that would make the wolves of Wall Street's mouth water if they knew what the hell all these terms actually meant. So this gets us to the battle. Welcome back to The Breakdown with me, NLW. It's a daily podcast on macro, Bitcoin, and the big picture power shifts remaking our world. The Breakdown is sponsored by Crypto.com, Bitstamp, and Nexo.io, and produced and distributed by Coindesk. What's going on, guys? It is Wednesday, August 12th, and we're doing it. We're talking supply gate, although this time it's going to be in the context of a bigger narrative battle that I see emerging as crypto moves into a new bull market. First, however, let's do the brief. First up on the brief today, TikTok tracking trouble. A new Wall Street Journal study has found that TikTok has, in fact, been playing a little loose with data policies, and While it's not a smoking gun of sharing data with the CCP, it certainly validates the argument around data practice malpractice when it comes to TikTok. So here are the first couple graphs of the Wall Street Journal article. TikTok skirted a privacy safeguard in Google's Android operating system to collect unique identifiers from millions of mobile devices, data that allows the app to track users online without allowing them to opt out. The tactic, which experts in mobile phone security said was concealed through an unusual added layer of encryption, appears to have violated Google policies, limiting how apps track people, and wasn't disclosed to TikTok users. So this has to do with something called MAC addresses, media access control addresses, and there is something of a history of these. Apple had locked down iPhone MAC addresses back in 2013, which basically means they didn't allow third-party apps to look at or interact with the identifier. Google did the same thing with Android in 2015, and TikTok basically figured out a way to bypass that restriction. Now, according to this study from the journal, TikTok collected these MAC addresses for about 15 months, ending with an update in November of last year, which was really when ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, was starting to fall under really intense scrutiny in D.C., This matters, obviously, in the context of the ongoing debate and discussion around TikTok and China, but my hope is that it gets a broader conversation about every app's data policies as well. I think that the critique or counter-critique of people who are saying, well, TikTok's fine because US companies do the same thing, completely misses the point in some ways uh, with regard to the CCP versus the US government. However, at the same time, I do think that the point that we should apply a similar scrutiny and intense scrutiny to the data practices of at-home American apps is dead on. So maybe that will be a positive outcome of this whole TikTok skirmish. Next up on the brief today, some new inflation figures. According to Labor Department figures that were released today, core inflation rose 0.6% from the previous month there had been a 0.6% gain in June as well. And again, we always talk about when we're looking at this data because the way that it interacts with markets has to do with expectations. And according to a Bloomberg survey of economists, the median forecast had been a 0.3% rise. Some of the things driving this were increase in prices of clothing that rose 1.1% after a 1.7% jump in June. Used cars also rose 2.3% this month, which was the most they had since early 2010. Overall, this was the biggest core inflation jump we've seen since 1991. Now, as we've discussed on this show before, the CPI excludes food and fuel, and the logic for this is that they're highly inelastic, right? The demand for them is going to be there no matter what happens, so they're not necessarily as good at showing a general rise in prices across goods. I've explained before why I think that the way that we measure inflation, or at least the way that we discuss it in the media, by not including the things that regular people experience so much, disconnects it from economic reality, even if it makes sense from an economic theory perspective. But that's not really the conversation for today. The conversation here is that we are seeing inflation rise in a monthly way. 
That said, we only see a 1.6% inflation year over year, which is obviously below the 2% target or really the 2% plus target that the Fed has set. I probably don't have to explain to you if you're listening to this podcast why the latest measures of inflation are going to matter, but this is the central question of our times in many ways from a monetary policy perspective is whether we are going to have a period of inflation because of this rampant money printing, whether the forces of shadow dollars around the system are going to dampen that, whether the larger deflationary trends put a cap on how much inflation there can actually be. These are all really, really big questions that the narrative around them has huge competition and huge potential implications in terms of what assets to buy and how much and all that sort of good stuff. So the way to treat these are just one more set of data in a very noisy, complicated data set to continue to debate. Last up, let's check in on the micro strategy stock. So speaking of inflation, yesterday MicroStrategy, which is a business intelligence company, announced that they were moving their core reserve asset from cash to Bitcoin, and they had bought $250 million worth of Bitcoin, a little over 21,000 Bitcoin, as part of this move. The reason was exactly this thing that we were talking about before, which is a concern about the potential for inflation and a corresponding sense that maybe dollars weren't the best place to store value for their shareholders. Well, shareholders liked what they heard, and the share price jumped from 123.44 to a high of above 144 before finally settling back at about 135.98, 136 or so, which was a 10.29% gain on the day. This is obviously hugely important in terms of the precedent that it sets. And that's really the whole name of this game is that MicroStrategy is basically creating a template, a playbook, and a narrative reasoning for companies to think about shifting some portion of their resources out of cash and into an alternative asset like Bitcoin and being rewarded for it in the market. And that's really the key part of this one today, this discussion today, as opposed to just yesterday when it had just happened, is that the market rewarded them for it. Interesting stuff there, but let's move on now to our main discussion about Supplygate and the battle to frame the narrative of the coming crypto bull run. All right, so let's talk Supplygate. And I guess first a caveat, I'm not going to get that deep into the issue at hand. My framing and my interest has to do with how this fits into what I see as the beginning of a broader battle around the narrative. So If you're interested in the details of it, I refer you to Twitter, to one of the million articles that's been written about it, or to Pomp's podcast from Wednesday with Pierre Richard, who is at the center of the story, where they get deeper into what actually happened. For my part, setting up the frame for this narrative battle, I think we need to talk history a little bit. So first, let's talk some very caricature-esque perceptions of Bitcoin versus Ethereum and Ethereum versus Bitcoin. I think the way that Bitcoin, at least the Twitter part of the community, sees Ethereum is as a thing that distracted people for a while, for a long time, as a thing that created a mechanism in ERC tokens for many projects that were either intentionally or accidentally scams, or at least ended up vaporizing value through tokens that never went anywhere. What's more, I think that a lot of Bitcoin folks who don't like Ethereum think that Ethereum misses the whole point that the blockchain doesn't matter, just the asset that it enables, that blockchains are stupid technology, actually, and that what is useful is the monetary asset that they create and open up the possibility of. Now, the way that Ethereum people, especially those on Twitter, see Bitcoin is kind of the grouchy old man screaming at the clouds. They are, in some ways, the boomers of the crypto world. They are, for many, some libertarian caricature of someone. And They don't get, this is what, again, the Ethereum folks think, Bitcoiners think, they don't get that an asset alone isn't disruptive enough and that the implications of the technology are much bigger, that you should strive for much more. Now, again, to be very, very clear about this, there's probably not even one single person who feels exactly the way that I just described. These are the caricatures, though, and these are the extremist takes that tend to be rewarded by social media systems that reward extremist takes, which unfortunately is all the social media systems that we have. But I still think that this caricature of how each side sees the other is important in the conversation that we're going to have about narratives. 
So moving again into history, in any market, there are going to be narrative leaders. And from 2017 to the 2018 boom, while obviously Bitcoin's 20k rally was the big banner headline, in many ways it really was the ICO boom. That was the thing that was driving a huge amount of capital into the space. It was making people rich overnight. It was the ridiculous, crazy reason that people built 200 hedge funds, many of which have shuttered since then. Now, since that ICO boom died, and it was weird how long it took it to fizzle out, it was very clearly kind of at its apex for a few months there, but when it did finally peter out halfway through 2018, since then it's basically impossible to deny that the narrative has been Bitcoin all the way. It has been the Bitcoin narrative, the Bitcoin triumphant narrative that has resonated. When you see how institutions have moved into this space over the last year and a half, It's not the general get involved in enterprise blockchain or see what all these new types of applications and the world computer and Web3 can do. The thing that they're buying into is the narrative of a hedge against fiat debasement. And that is the Bitcoin narrative. It is digital gold all the way. Now let's look at the period again between mid-2018 and early 2020 pre-COVID. An interesting thing happened. First, you saw these layer one competitors sort of start to fade into obscurity. EOS went nowhere, and Tron screamed and bought a lunch with Warren Buffett, but did nothing, and et cetera, et cetera, right? And at the same time, this Bitcoin narrative was taking hold on a bigger level. You had more institutions getting involved. You also saw the non Bitcoin energy in the crypto space shift, again, away from these layer one projects in many cases, away from the web three decentralized the web projects, and into decentralized finance, specifically DeFi. One of the interesting things about DeFi was it was a return to the financial sector that was at the root of this whole experiment, and away from the idea of a user-owned web three or an idea of a world computer that got you out of some of the problems of a monopolist technology era that had come to define us and control us instead of being something that we controlled. Now, an important caveat is that there are still plenty of those Web3 dreams out there. It may be a narrative that is poised for a return. You have folks like Balaji who are talking about it more after in the wake of things like the TikTok fricassee that we've been talking about on the show for the last few months. But there's no way to deny that the Web3 narrative is much smaller relative to DeFi than it was even a few months ago. So anyways, you now have the setup for this interesting thing going into the COVID part of 2020. You have one, a Bitcoin that increasingly has product narrative fit around digital gold as a hedge around fiat debasement. And you have DeFi which is not there yet, but is emerging as an actually interesting active sector of crypto that isn't just exclusively Bitcoin. So now let's talk the last few months. First, when it comes to Bitcoin, if we thought there was product narrative fit before, oh my god, could there be anything more profound than having your programmatic, predictable plan supply reduction happen at the same time that money printer go burr and that meme takes over the world in the context of the COVID response. If that resonance wasn't clear, all we have to do is look at the Paul Tudor Jones announcement. All we have to do is look at the news from MicroStrategy this week. Bitcoin as a thing that matters because the world of central banks are just going to rev that engine from here to eternity is a hugely powerful product narrative fit. What's going on, guys? I'm excited to share that one of this month's breakdown sponsors is Crypto.com. Crypto.com offers one of the most cost-efficient ways to purchase crypto out there, as they've just waived the 3.5% credit card fee for all crypto purchases. What's more, with Crypto.com's MCO Visa card, you can get up to 10% back on things like food and grocery shopping. When you buy gift cards with the Crypto.com app, you can get up to 20% back. Download the Crypto.com app today and enjoy these offers until the end of September. Bitstamp is the original global cryptocurrency exchange. Since 2011, Bitstamp has been the preferred exchange for serious traders and investors. Trusted by over 4 million customers, including top financial institutions. Bitstamp is built on professional-grade trading technology. Their platform is powered by a NASDAQ matching engine, and their APIs are recognized as the best in the industry. 
Download the Bitstamp app from the App Store or Google Play, or visit bitstamp.net slash pro to learn more and start trading today. That's bitstamp.net slash pro. In this crisis, many investors aim to keep and grow their digital assets. Others seek to maximize the yield on their cash. Nexo allows you to achieve exactly these two goals. The company offers instant crypto credit lines against all major cryptocurrencies, with interest rates starting from only 5.9% APR. Nexo also lets you earn up to 10% annually on your fiat and digital assets. What's more, interest is paid out daily, and you can add or withdraw funds at any time. Get started at nexo.io. Now let's also talk DeFi. In the same period, I think we have to hold aside the narrative piece because frankly, this hasn't been a narrative-driven space. It has been a sandbox for insiders. But for those insiders, what a sandbox it has been. There has been an explosion of basically what amounts to financial engineering experiments. I know that word is a dirty word on Wall Street, and so it's a dirty word in crypto too, but really these are experiments in permissionless open financial engineering, and In many cases, they've made a ton of those participants a lot of money. So do you see where I'm going with this? We have an extremely powerful stew right now. On the one hand, we have a leading narrative in the leading asset, which is Bitcoin, that is hugely resonant for a wide set of people. In fact, the widest set of people it's ever been resonant with. On the other hand, we have this financial sandbox doing stupid, crazy things that would make the wolves of Wall Street's mouth water if they knew what the hell all these terms actually meant. So this gets us to the battle. For people who like both of these things, which, by the way, is a greater number than Twitter would tell you, this is an incredibly powerful combination of assets to have going into a bull market. In fact, Anil from Delphi Digital wrote about this, and I even did a podcast read of his comments. He wrote an op-ed on Coindesk about how these two forces were going to come together to drive the new market. But there are a lot of folks, especially folks who have been in this industry for a while, who are bringing with them the lineage of past battles. And for them, there's no way to see this moment as anything other than a zero-sum narrative competition. In that context, Supplygate was the first, but it certainly won't be the last skirmish. So first, let's talk about quickly what happened. And again, I point you to Pomp's podcast with Pierre Richard if you want more details or many of the articles that have been written about this. But effectively, over last weekend, Michael Goldstein and Pierre Richard started asking on Twitter whether it was possible to verify the full monetary supply of ETH independently, right? And the answers that they got weren't satisfying to them. Some pointed them to Etherscan. Some pointed them to coin market cap, including Vitalik. And because they didn't like the answers they got, Richard put up a bounty of a million Satoshis, about $100, a little more than $100, for the development of a script that would verify the total ETH supply. When people started doing this, they got some results that weren't exactly the same. In fact, they were 340,000 ETH higher than that which was displayed on coin market cap which had been again used as a reference point for the total ETH supply. Now this quickly got into recriminations and accusations with bitcoiners saying how is it possible that you don't actually know the supply of your thing that you say is going to be a money in some way? How is it possible that you can't independently verify it? People on the other side saying basically this is a bad faith argument you're just trying to rip on us like you always do and yada 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 or some variation of that. And from there, it descended into more back and forth, but you get the general picture. Effectively, the question is two parts. One, what is the supply of Ethereum? And two, why is it so hard to verify it? So let's talk about why this would matter to Bitcoiners. For many Bitcoiners, monies that have either unlimited supplies or a central authority that can change those supplies on a whim aren't really legitimate as monies. They are doomed to inevitable debasement. And even for Bitcoiners who aren't that hardcore, they aren't necessarily pure hard money, sound money people, they certainly think that this idea of a money that doesn't have a cap supply doesn't really answer the problems that people are having via this mainstream narrative of money printer go burr. The point here is that Bitcoiners have a question around the legitimacy of Ether as a money particularly when weighed against Bitcoin. Now, the second or flip side of this question is, why would Ethereans not care about this question of supply? 
and being clear that I'm not saying that all don't, ultimately for many, the argument for the value accrual of the base asset of Ethereum is the activity that takes place on top of it, not the centrality or the capped nature of the supply. In other words, you have two very different assets with two largely different aspirations, having two different conversations, but trying to fight in some ways because they're applying their value set to one another. I thought that Udi Wertheimer, who I think if anyone would associate with one asset, it would be Bitcoin, although really he's more a troll and contrarian in a positive way than anything else wrote a thread about just why this might not be the right way to approach the argument. And I want to read it in total because he basically says what I wanted to say about it. He kicks off, I salute Bitstein and Pierre Richard for their investigative work on covering the ETH supply gate, but it's time to articulate the steel man argument. God only knows that no one else can pull it off. Grab your cancellation torches and ready the thread. Ethereum and Bitcoin are very different. There are some surface level similarities, users need to understand private keys, mining is a cool word, both can trade on Binance, etc. But everything else is different. Goals, value, culture, sex orgies. That's a joke. One huge difference that puts everything else in context. Bitcoin is a digital asset with a blockchain, Ethereum is a blockchain with a digital asset. Read this again a couple of times and then move on to the next tweet. Both sides like to accuse each other of moving the goalpost over the years, but this is always true since day one of each project. Bitcoin was always presented as a better form of money. Its blockchain was always described as a necessary implementation detail and a flaw. Meanwhile, Ethereum and everything about it stem from a belief that blockchains can make the world better. Real talk, not easy for me to hide how silly I think this is, but I'm trying. The ETH asset was always explained away as a necessary, flawed element of making this work. Now, details changed along the way. Bitcoin was said to be a payment network, then a store of value with a lot of in-between. Its underlying tech had a lot of promises that didn't turn out, too. ETH was gas, it was money, it was a cryptocurrency, it was inflating, deflating the works. But, lots of projects tried to become digital money. Bitcoin is the first that didn't fail yet. Lots of projects tried to decentralize everything. God, I'm really not the right person to try and champion this view. Ethereum is the first that didn't fail yet. Is it really necessary to say anything else? I'm sure you can see it by now. Bitcoin is a digital asset first. The technology is, at best, a distant second on many Bitcoiners' priorities. Of course, all they care about is sound monetary policy, that's what they're here for. But Ethereum people don't care as much about that, just like an Apple holder doesn't exclusively care about stock structure. Sure, it's important, it's even very important, but it's really not anywhere near the top priority for many investors. As far as ETH holders are concerned, the blockchain is what matters. As long as consensus is kept, that means that, among other things, there's consensus on supply too. Not knowing what it is exactly doesn't matter. ETH is an implementation detail to them. ETH supply will change and fluctuate over time anyways, as people's preferences change. For them, this is fine. For me, I don't find that appealing, which is one of the reasons I'm not a long-term ETH holder. But I understand the difference in priorities, and you should too. One good thing that came out of this, in my opinion, is that it helps shed light on the differences between the two communities. Hardline Bitcoiners don't understand Ethereum people at all, and vice versa. It's really quite amusing given how obsessed the two camps are with one another. That's it from me on the subject. Culture wars aren't super important in the grand scheme of things, it's more important to just make money. But perhaps, keeping other people's blind spots in mind could help you on that quest. You may cancel me now. So I think that Udi's thread does a great job highlighting why in some ways this battle is silly. These assets aren't trying to be the same thing, and the root of legitimacy each is trying to achieve emanates from different sources. At the same time, though, the reason this fight isn't stupid is that the external world still tends to lump all these things together. I think another few tweets exemplify this. Jameson Lopp tweeted, Supplygate isn't about the supply of ETH. By examining Ethereum through the lens of an auditor, Pierre Richard is tugging on a thread that unravels the complexities and trade-offs made by Ethereum, showing that it's not just, quote, Bitcoin with more functionality. And of course, that last point, the fact that some people argue that Ethereum is just Bitcoin with more functionality, is the real nut of that. Another comment came from Andre Neves on Udi's actual thread and made it clear in the same way. He said, I have no problem with ETH as long as it's not marketed to newcomers of the industry as, quote, better digital money similar to Bitcoin. Otherwise, it's disingenuous and, given the ICO, initial distribution, constant narrative pivot, rather scammy. ETH is a gas for a blockchain, nothing more. A rather centralized blockchain, which is fine and has its use cases, but it's not money and that should be made clearer. 
So now we're seeing one of these narrative battles because one of the memes that Ethereum folks have chosen to drive in the last, call it 12 months or so, is the ETH is money meme. And of course, this complicates that idea that these two things are going after the same space. Now, there's a final dimension of this, which is an interpretation at core of what the argument is. As you can see from Udi and Jameson Lopp and others, there's a focus on what the Ethereum supply is and whether it should have some cap like Bitcoin, or rather, if it doesn't have a cap, how it's not legitimate. But interestingly, on Pomp's podcast today, Pierre Richard made a very strong point that in his mind, what mattered wasn't the hard cap. It wasn't about having Ethereum have to replicate the hard cap. It was about the independent verifiability being a key common thread across decentralized systems. In Pierre's perspective, that is a prerequisite of offering something different than the Fed. The ability to independently verify and trust or have belief and faith in what the supply actually is so you know what percentage of the supply you have and you know how it's changing over time. Interestingly, that more technical and potentially a point that I think has a lot more room for agreement between these two camps got lost in the battle, and that's kind of the point that I'm making. Everyone assumes bad faith, which is understandable, but also a bummer. So what are the takeaways here? There are, of course, multiple dimensions, but the one that I'm really interested in is the narrative skirmish. And I think that we're on the verge of seeing a lot more of this. Everyone can feel a new bull market in the air. You can see it in the price. I mean, hell, I did a whole podcast about it like three days ago, all the evidence for it. And in that context, if you take a zero-sum view of the total attention, the total resources, the total capital that can come into this space or be allocated in this space, it creates an incentive to have these battles on a more vicious kind of level. Obviously, by virtue of the fact that I'm discussing it, I think it's important. However, I also don't think this sort of battle internally on Twitter is hugely problematic, and for a few reasons. One, I think that these things are a little predetermined in terms of where people are going to find their interest in this space. I don't think that what we battle about on Twitter is going to have a dramatic impact on it. Second, I think that the immune system of Bitcoin that goes after contenders and challengers is a feature, not a bug. I think it's been to Bitcoin's benefit by being able to fight off forces that want to try to capture it. So unfortunately, even if you don't find it particularly enjoyable, I think it's an important part of this whole social ecosystem. Third, I think it's fine for Ethereum to not care about supply or not have supply as a central dimension of the narrative that it's telling the world. But if it's not going to be that, if it's going to be a different narrative than Bitcoin, it has to be really crisp and good at articulating what it cares about and what's different about it and what it offers that other assets don't. This is a great time to double down on figuring that out or at least better articulating it. I do think also that it's possible that even in the context of a different answer about what matters to Ethereum and why it's a valuable asset, it may actually have to have an answer for this supply question strictly because of the mood of the time and the larger context of fiat questioning. Chow Wang wrote, There's a renewed debate over the monetary policy of Bitcoin versus Ethereum. I'm not interested in the academic discussion, but I know the mass psychology. If you can't explain your monetary policy in a few simple words, the herd will simply not buy your story. BTC is 21 million. What's ETH? I think if I'm interested in Ethereum, I take that message to heart and figure out what my answer to it is. Which, by the way, it's entirely possible that lots of people already have and I'm just missing it, so I don't want to be dismissive of that possibility. But for me, ultimately, all of this again comes back to the idea that there is the beginnings of a new bull market, and this is, I think, an opening salvo of a type of battle that we're going to see over and over again, which is the battle to frame the narrative for the next bull run. That battle is, like it or not, gonna be a part of the next few months or longer, so strap up, buckle in, and get ready. All right, guys, with that, let's wrap. I appreciate you listening. Let me know what you thought, and until tomorrow, be safe and take care of each other. Peace.